The Andes Mountains in Boyacá, Colombia hold a unique treasure that's been fought over for centuries. The Indians, conquistadors, government, guerrillas and drug lords have all sought control of this land for one reason. It's the richest source of emeralds that the world has ever known. My name is Thomas Nagin, and I'm a mineral explorer. For the last 35 years, I've traveled the world in search of the finest gems, crystals, and minerals. Now, I'm taking you along with me. <laughs> we'll visit some of the richest mines and discover just what it takes to unearth these natural treasures. It's going to be one heck of an explosion. It's okay. Come on. Welcome to Colombia, a beautiful country, rich in culture and full of charm. I fell in love with this place over 20 years ago when I operated a quartz mine in Santander. Colombia's history of violence and illegal drug production has created a misleading portrait of this place that has so much more to offer. It's the second largest producer of flowers and famous for having some of the world's best coffee. The, uh, the yellow is, is ripe, huh? Most of the coffee is grown on small family farms, less than five acres. Then the beans are dried, roasted, and packaged for retailers around the world. You haven't had a good cup of coffee until you've had a cup of Colombian coffee right from the source. Colombian coffee, best in the world. There's really a lot to see and do, but we came in search of Colombia's other claim to fame, emeralds. Colombia produces over one half of the world's emeralds, and we're headed to two of the country's most famous mines, Muso and Colsquais. But first, we'll check out the capital city of Bogota. I come here every couple of years to meet up with my good friend, Fernando, and hunt for emeralds in the world's largest emerald district. This is an area that's six square blocks of nothing but people buying and selling emeralds and jewelry stores. It's the emerald center of the world, really. Over 60% of the world's emeralds come from Bogota and the surrounding mines. You don't have to hang around the Emerald District long till someone will come and show you what they've got. This place is literally teeming with people buying and selling emeralds. How many people work in this area? There's about 10,000 people that are uh, buy and sell on commission. They stand around here, they buy and sell to each other. They buy and sell to emerald buyers that come from all over the world. Ah, this, this, is, a, uh, this is an emerald setting in calcite. Uh -huh. Ah, see. Oh, okay. This is the type of bag that they use in the mine to carry their, their emeralds and their uh, money. Pero usted tiene comida ahí también sí. o no? No, no, no. Ah, no, no. <laughs> oh, look at that. Ese viene de qué mina? Esto es de Muso. Ah, uh, this is from Muso. And it's a, uh, it's got pyrite all on the inside. Eso Fernando has... Ah, estaba... uh, they broke this stone and the inside was all filled full of pyrite. Interesante. No tiene esmeraldas. <laughs> you can find all sorts of minerals in the Emerald District. And everywhere we went, people were stopping us to show us their wares. But I was eager to get to the source of these gemstones. And there'll be plenty of time for shopping after we get back. The mines are located over 150 miles north of Bogota by way of Chinquiquera. These mines aren't open to the public. In fact, they're heavily guarded to keep people out but we've got a great guide to help us get into these otherwise inaccessible locations. Fernando travels frequently to the mines and knows a lot about the emerald business. What we're doing is we're gonna to try to plan our trip to the emerald mines. Okay. Um, 
This is Bogota, right? Okay. He suggested that we get a good, experienced driver for the road ahead. We need another banana. <laughs> That's when he introduced us to Don Segundo. Segundo has been in the emerald business for many years. He was around in the 1980s at the beginning of the Emerald Wars, a 60-year conflict involving the guerrilla groups, paramilitary groups, drug cartels, and the government, all battling over the profits of these stones. At that time, Pablo Escobar, head of a notorious drug cartel, tried to take control of the emerald mines as a way to launder profits from the cocaine industry. In 1990, the Bishop of Chinquiquira helped broker a truce, ending the emerald wars and much of the violence. The security is a lot better now over the last eight years, and people are not uh, afraid so much. Now, Colombia is a pretty nice place. <laughs> Colombia is a country that's both culturally and geographically diverse. We've been traveling over a high plateau in the Andes Mountains, but now we're descending into a much more tropical environment with heavy rainfall and runoff from the mountains, which wreak havoc on the roads. As you can see, there's a lot of water on the way to the mine here. A lot of waterfalls, beautiful waterfalls, but they wash out the roads. That's the problem. That's why we see so many workers on the roads here, because the roads keep washing out. Roads don't seem to be getting any better as we're getting closer to the mine. But it's getting more exciting. We're arriving at the Rio Minero. It's right below here. This river passes by all of the emerald mines. It's the richest river in the world. Let's see what we have here. Oh, wow. This broad river cuts through the Fura and Tenna peaks, where according to Muso legend, God created the first humans. To the Muso Indians, this area was essentially a Garden of Eden, and it's easy to see why. But modern man's attempts to tame this area have been met with some challenges challenges that I learned about firsthand as we were told of some of the obstacles ahead that could add several hours to our already difficult drive. He's telling us that we need to go to Cosquase before we can see if we can get to uh, Muso going this way. We might have to take a different route. It's been raining really a lot here and uh, the roads are really bad in a lot of places, but we won't be able to find out till we get to Cosquase. We're approaching the mine of Cosquase now. But right over here is Peña Blanca. This is the road that goes to Peña Blanca. And we can't go there because it's supposedly, it's supposedly very, very dangerous. They won't let you enter or uh, go even near the mine. And from here to a Cosquase, <laughs> I was gonna say, from here to Cosquase, it's really dangerous. <laughs> but really, the only danger we faced that morning was the roads. Driving through the Andes, you can run into all sorts of trouble from gun-toting militants to drug dealers. But luckily, we haven't experienced any of that on this trip, and we arrive safely at Cosquais just after noon. Getting to the mines is difficult enough. Getting in them is another story altogether. Segundo's good friend Ernesto is a local mine owner. He's one of the most respected men in the whole area and he will be our ticket into the mines. This is Adolfo Romero. He's the administrator here at the mine. We've been fortunate to go someplace where few people get to go, and he's gonna let us have a closer look. What you see here is the typical open pit mining scene. The bulldozer does most of the work as the miners look for traces of emeralds. But the majority of the mining's been done by hand in the nearby tunnels. You can see these holes that are in the side of the mountain here. These are all different separate mines. They go into the hillside, some of them as much as 100 meters, and they're all dug by hand. They've found lots of emeralds in each one of these. Now we're gonna go down here below and look at the bulldozer, where the bulldozer is clearing away. I'd love to go into one of these holes up here. <laughs> I 
Kolskwais has produced some of the largest emeralds in the world, including the 7,000 carat Amelia Emerald Crystal. But finds like that don't happen every day. Weeks or even months of backbreaking labor will oftentimes yield little or no results. Around the perimeter of the mine is where you find the Wakeros. They're a familiar sight in all of the emerald mines. They're freelance miners who soar through the overburden that's been pushed out of the mines. Because they've been digging here recently, what they're doing here now is they're washing the, uh, they're washing the, the dirt and the rocks to see if they can find any emeralds. They take it with the shovel and they spread it out and see if they see any green. Waqueros around Colombia all use the same process, searching for emeralds a shovel full at a time in hopes of seeing that green sparkle. They lent me a shovel so I could try my hand at being a Waquero. It's hard work, but after a few minutes, I started to understand. With every shovel full, you can't help but imagine you're about to uncover a big emerald. And I think that's part of the attraction of being a walk hero. It's kind of like gambling. With the next throw of the dice, you just might hit that big jackpot. <laughs> I didn't find any emeralds, but we still scored big when Ernesto pulled some strings and got us permission to go inside one of the largest operating tunnels in Colesquays. We're walking deep into one of the tunnels here in Coast Quays. These tunnels are only about one meter wide and not even as tall as me. And they've taken lots of emeralds out of here. Now they're not working this one at the moment, but this is how they've always traditionally done the mining here. There's actually dozens and dozens of tunnels like this throughout this mountainside where they hunt for the emeralds. They've taken millions and millions and millions of dollars worth out of here and I hope to do many more. They use these tubes here to pump air into the deepest reaches of the tunnel. What it's for is to push out all of the poisonous gases and also to put fresh air in for the people to breathe. In this area right here, there was a landslide and they've put these posts here to hold back the earth and the stones from covering over the entrance. When digging the tunnels, the miners use jackhammers and dynamite. But when they come across indicators like this... See, that's calcite all up in there. Calcite is a calcium carbonate and a possible indicator of emeralds. They switch to lighter tools so they don't damage or fracture the stones. They then start looking for green. We could have spent the entire day checking out the labyrinth of tunnels at Coast Quays, but we had to hit the road if we were going to make it to Muso before dark. I hope we didn't breathe any of the poisonous gases that they're trying to pump out of here. <laughs> the drive from Cosquais to Muso is one of the most beautiful drives in all of Colombia, but it's also one of the most dangerous. We're headed for Muso now, and we're looking forward to our ride here. <laughs> We thought the roads to Coast Quays were bad, but they were nothing compared to this. Remember the guy we met on the way to Coast Quays? He warned us there might be some treacherous roads on the way to Muso, and boy was he right. The heavy rains had made the dangerous roads even more treacherous. Our back tire slipped over the edge. We all thought we were going to die. Even Segundo started sweating bullets. <laughs> I love you, Segundo. <laughs> Luckily, he's a great driver and kept his cool. All I could do was laugh. Robert Frost said the road less traveled makes all the difference. For us, 
The difference was a shorter drive with spectacular views, a little adventure, and a few good stories to share back home. Dos, tres, we finally arrived safely in Muso. And after our long journey, we decided to take a tour of the town. It's an active place with small hotels, shops, a few hardware stores and markets. And after nearly falling to our death, we decided we really needed to try a local drink. Alex, I'll drink for you. Thank oh, you. Oh, no, no, you'll drink for yourself. One of the many dangers of going to the Emerald <laughs> Sabahone is like a Colombian eggnog. Here, have a drink of Sabahone. With rum. Good, huh? <laughs> While getting our morning coffee, we met a woman whose story is not uncommon in Colombia. Back in 1995, her mother was killed in the crossfire of a gunfight on this very corner. Nearly 3,000 people were killed during the Emerald Wars of the 1990s. But they're just the most recent casualties of a conflict that's been fought for centuries. It's just a few miles down to the Rio Minero where there's a big contrast between the life in Muso and the life on the river. During Spanish colonization, the location of these emerald deposits was a tightly held secret that led to years of fighting. Eventually, the conquistadors claimed the territory and exported Colombian emeralds around the world. And while the native Indians lost their battle with the Spanish colonists, the Muso mine and the nearby town still carry the name of the tribe that made this area famous. It's like going back in time. If you were to imagine the Wild West or the time of the gold rush, this is what it must have been like. Houses and shacks are staggered precariously on the hillsides. Running water and electricity simply just do not exist here. From what I could see, not much had changed since I had last visited, except how most of the mining is being done. This stream here comes down from the main mine. In the past, what they used to do, they used to work, work it as an open pit mine. They would use bulldozers, and they were looking for the veins of emeralds. Then they'd push to get rid of the dirt, or what they call the overburden. They would push the dirt over the side of the mountain, and the stream would carry it down into the Rio Minero. Down in the Rio Minero, the miners, the waqueros, would look for things on their own independently. Anything they found was theirs. But up on top of the mountain, that's where the mine, the principal mine, was operating and nobody was allowed in. There was strict security up there. Submachine guns, everybody was armed. Nowadays, all they're doing is tunneling because they're not allowed to push that dirt over the side of the mountain. It clogs up the river and it makes it hard on the environment. Because of the environmental concerns, the miners at Muso now work exclusively in tunnels, and we were hoping to get a look inside of one of them. No hay mucha producción ahora. Oh, okay. Not a lot of production now. No están trabajando ahora. Not working in now? Oh, okay. The mine might have been closed, but Waqueros work every day. When I last visited Muso in the mid-80s, there were thousands of waqueros working in the river, but their numbers have drastically dropped. Without the mine pushing off fresh overburden into the river, emeralds have become harder to find. Today, there are only a few dozen left here, barely getting by on the small pieces that are left behind. ¿Cuánto tiempo tiene trabajando aquí como vaquero? Yo ya llevo 37 años. ¿Siempre en el río? Todo. Todos los días uno camina, uh -huh. echa pala, lava tierra. 37 years, 37 años, huh? 37 años. Muchos. Claro, arte. Yeah. You're 57 years old, and so uh, since you were 20 years old, desde 20 años está trabajando aquí. Ah, muy bien. Gracias. Bueno, que tenga buen día. Back in these hills, there are few options for employment. Some people make a living on small farms, but for many, the river is their best opportunity for income. The majority of the Waqueros work alone, sifting through the water and gravel with a shovel 
or breaking rocks with calcite veins. Others work in small groups as a team. Uh-huh. At this is tiny calcita. There's pyrite and calcite on the inside here. This is the type of material that comes out of the veins in the uh, emerald zone. A ver si hay otra. Pero no hay esmeralda. No hay esmeralda. ¿Qué es la esmeralda más grande que has encontrado? Por ahí unos 15 kilatitos. 15 carats. Wow. ¿Y cuánto vale uno de 15 kilates? 5 million pesos. He sold it for. Uh -huh. Un material ya bonito. Sí. Uh -huh. Es un material ya bonito. Sí. Es un material ya puede, se puede tallar. Ah, uh -huh. that's some material that you can cut. He says you can pass it. Gracias, Jose. ¿Por qué has escogido ese sitio para trabajar? ¿Piensa que hay esmeralda aquí? ¿Sí? ¿Está encontrando? ¿Sí? ¿Tiene algo para mostrar? They had some uh, emeralds they're going to show me here. This small container of emeralds was the result of days, possibly weeks, of back-breaking labor. ¿Eso has encontrado aquí? Sí, uh -huh. ¿Encuentra algunas cosas más grandes? Sí. ¿Me muestra? Ya, ya vendimos. <laughs> you already sold them, huh? The stones he showed me were worth maybe $100 on the black market. It's rare for a walk hero to find stones worth more than $1,000, but it can happen. One great find could change the life of not just the miner, but his or her entire family. After a morning on the river, we went to the nearby camp El Mosato to eat with some of the locals. Makeshift kitchens served up eggs and bread and lots of hospitality. We joked and laughed with the miners as they shared with us their stories of the river and their passion for emeralds. Emerald mining in Muso dates back to at least 1000 AD, with some estimates going back as far as 1000 BC. It's a major part of the culture here and it was an honor to get to share in that continuing tradition. We learned a lot over the last few days about mining and the lifestyle surrounding two of the most famous emerald mines. But nowhere will you find a better selection of Colombian emeralds than the Emerald District in downtown Bogota, where I like to go to see the largest variety and get the best stones is the Jimenez Avenue, where the commissionistas work. They either have or can find anything and everything you're looking for. Uncut emeralds, cut emeralds, emeralds mounted in gold, crystals in matrix, and even sculpted emeralds. A lot of rocks, huh? <laughs> There's some great deals to be found here, if you know what you're looking for. When buying an emerald, you want to look for clarity, color, brilliance, and the cut. The clarity is how well you can see through the stone, but most emeralds will have some imperfections, so be cautious if it's too clear. Two million pesos, that's about, it's a thousand dollars. When looking at color, the darker, the better. But also, the darker the color, the more expensive the stone. If you're looking at cut emeralds, you want the facets to be even. It's the cut that gives the stone its brilliance, and the brilliance is all about the sparkle. The more sparkle, the better. If you like emerald crystals in Matrix, you want to make sure you're not buying an uncut emerald that's been glued to the rock. This is a glued piece. This piece is a repaired or glued piece. Emerald collectors love these stones in the natural rock formation, and the main thing here is to look for a natural termination where the emerald hasn't been broken in the mining process. If you're going to buy in the streets in Bogota, be sure to study up before your visit. If you don't know what you're looking at, it's easy to get confused or ripped off. Your best bet is to have someone with you who has some experience. Never offer the asking price, and always keep your money and passport safely tucked away. When you see something you really like, arrange a meeting off the streets where you can examine the specimen and negotiate away from the chaos. 
There's some great deals to be found here, but do your homework first and bring a friend. We've explored Colombia from the streets of Bogota to two of the most famous emerald mines in the world, and still only scratch the surface of what this amazing country has to offer. It's a rich country, alive in so many ways, from its natural beauty to its diverse culture. I'm sure we're going to be back, but we have many other places to explore. I'm Thomas Nagan, and I'm a mineral explorer. If you want to see more episodes or check out our mineral collection, click the link in the description. And of course, like and subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Mineral Explorers.